a positive result in most of the patients. Skin pitch tests are usually preferred means of testing and are applied to the previously affected areas. It gives a positive reaction in only up to 50% of patients. Histopathological features of the GRIF are not specific and variable. Typically, a superficial perivascular infiltrate of mononuclear cells is observed. Other features are also reported including subcorneal pustules, vacuolar changes, and hydropic degeneration with subepidermal bully and necrotic keratinocytes. So what are the treatment options for Sidreef? It's basically a benign self-limiting disease and treatment involves the withdrawal of culprit agent and supportive management. Usually topical steroids are prescribed. Systemic steroids are sometimes required to speed up the healing process. Antihistamines can be an option for symptomatic management of itching. So now I will discuss some related case reports of Sidreef that we have uh, taken up from some journals. Here is a literature review with case report showing Sidreef induced by doxycycline that is very common antibiotic being used. Another case report was found to be uh, associated with velacyclovir that is an antibiotic. Another exanthema was characterized by uh, after taking amoxicillin clavulinate that is another antibiotic it was also has been uh, seen with an association with biologics like infliximab a similar kind of eruption has also been seen in association with covid-19 vaccination astrazeneca so now you can see the variations from the culp ranging from common culprits like antibiotics such as doxycycline to biologics as well as covid-19 vaccinations so all the clinicians should be very cautious about prescribing the drugs. So now for concluding remarks of this presentation and case report, I will uh, invite Dr. Rizwan Rafiq for further discussion. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Rabbi zidni ilma. Uh, we are here to share the knowledge and to learn more from each other. Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. I am Dr. Muhammad Rizban Rafi. I am the assistant professor of dermatology, working as a consultant dermatologist, and I am the supervisor, supervisor of diploma in dermatology program. I joined this institute uh, around last, uh, since this last three years. And uh, then we started the program of Diploma of Dermatology here. So, uh, well, uh, our today's discussion is about baboon syndrome. Um, why we selected this case as a case of CPC, although uh, this is not a true or typical gray case, but there are three different reasons uh, behind this selection. Number one is reality of the condition. Number two, it's typical clinical presentation and number three is academic significance. If we talk about reality, since 1984 until date, total 100 cases are reported uh, as per Medscape data. But I believe this is not a true reflection of the disease. Uh, it's certainly underreported. And, uh, and the, 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 probably the reason behind this underreporting is the, the, the condition is benign self limiting asymptomatic and people may misdiagnose the condition is uh, astenia, intertrigo, uh, extra asthma and sometimes invasoriasis. The second reason behind the selection is its typical clinical presentation. As you see our case matching the all five criteria of baboon syndrome and third reason is academic significance. Baboon syndrome ka case FCPS part two ki theory mein aata raha hai. Uh, my exam was in October 16, so it was a case tha. Usse pehle bhi aaya hai. So basically, it's a good review for theory candidate. Or you can see it social media WhatsApp group. Mein bhi iski discussion, uh, karte honge, uh, dekhte rahe honge. Uh, recently, Dr. Saeed Zada Noor Mahmood has shared a case here. Kiya tha. Dr. Irfan Anwar has uh, shared a case here. Kiya tha. So uh, comfortably common, hai, but certainly it's underreported. अगर हम केस की बात करें अपने, so uh, basically uh, general, general surgery team consulted uh, us for this case, and uh, uh, after the history and examination, we made a clinical diagnosis of baboon syndrome, 
we advise some baseline investigation uh, to rule, rule out the other possible differential diagnosis to look at these cytopenias, eosinophilia, hepatic and renal side. Uh, we performed the, uh, the, the skin patch biopsy and the histopathology revealed some non-specific changes like superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. Um, here we suspect metronidazole as a culpating agent. So we hold that agent, we started some topical uh, mild steroid application along with zinc oxide paste as a barrier cream and antihistamine loratinine as per need basis. So uh, for the confirmation of metronidazole as a, as a culpating agent, we planned a phase test. And a follow-up uh, advised after seven days, and a follow-up patient shows a significant improvement. So uh, the take-home message behind this all scenario is: is, is your case is uh, rare but real. So you can report your case, and uh, we have to learn about these uh, uh, rare presentations. So we can easily manage it, and it will not be so easy now. So uh, that is uh, that's it from my side. So now we, I will call Dr. Mispa for the second case. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Mizba Zakir Abwad, and today I'm going to present a rare case. Of a 65 year old male, Naimuddin, son of Azizuddin, he is resident of Federal Bay Area, Karachi, married with four kids and a retired education officer. He has no prior comorbids and presented to the OPD with the complaints of asymptomatic reddish to brownish, firm swellings of variable sizes present on face and arms since the past two years. According to my patient, he was in his usual state of health until two years back when he noticed a painless small red bump on the right side of his nose. The bump gradually increased in size to become pea-sized in about a year. Similar new lesions were noticed on the nose, below the left eye, and two more lesions on the right upper arm. There was no preceding warmth, redness, itching, or pain prior to the development of these lesions. Patient also complained of fatigue, but denies any associated fever, night sweats, weight loss, or swellings in the neck or axilla. There is no complaints of double vision, retroorbital pain, eyelid swelling, nasal obstruction, epistaxis or oral ulcers. He has mild shortness of breath on exertion but denies any complaints of orthopnea, PNT, palpitations or pedal swelling. His pulmonary, gastrointestinal, renal, musculoskeletal, endocrinological and neurological systemic review is unremarkable. His past medical and surgical history is insignificant. He has no history of blood transfusions. There is no history of chronic diseases in the family or any skin disease in the family. His appetite and sleep has been normal. Micturation and bowel habits have been normal. He denies any addiction or allergies, and there is no history of weight loss or weight gain. He's a retired education officer and owns a house with well, four well-ventilated rooms. Two of his sons are the earning members of the family. Now, moving on to the examination, he's an old-age male of average height and build, sitting comfortably on the bed and well-oriented in time, place, and person. He has vitals of blood pressure of 130 by 80 millimeters of mercury, pulse of 84 beats per minute. He's afebrile with a respiratory rate of 20 breaths per minute. There is no palar, jaundice, clubbing, cyanosis, or pedal edema. Lymph nodes and thyroid are not palpable. JVB is not raised. 
Now moving on to the cutaneous examination, there's a reddish brown to yellowish well circumscribed non-tender nodule with irregular surface of 2 by 2 centimeter present slightly above the right ala of the nose with overlying surface telangiectasias. Similar smaller nodule is present on the nasal bridge. Similar three pea-sized reddish brown nodules with regular surface is present linearly on the cheek, laterally and below the left eye. A hyperpigmented nodule is present along with it. Multiple discrete yellowish to skin colored papules present predominantly on the forehead and malar area bilaterally. Similar lesions are present on the right forearm. Dioscopy shows, shows a lesion was blanchable, but no apple jelly nodules were seen. Three soft, non-tender, mobile skin-colored nodules are present on the left arm. It is not attached to the underlying structures or the overlying skin. His oral cavity mucosa was unremarkable. Hair and nails were normal. His cardiovascular, respiratory, abdominal, and CNS examination was unremarkable. Now, moving on to the differential diagnosis, uh, nodular uh, basal cell carcinoma, cutaneous sarcoidosis, histiocytosis, cutaneous lymphoma, pseudolymphoma, Chesner's lymphocytic infiltrate, primary cutaneous nodular amyloidosis, and leukemia cutis. Investigations, CBC showed, CBC, uh, showed completely normal profile with peripheral smear showing normocytic normochromic. ESR was 10 millimeter in the first half, which was also normal. His metabolic panel, urine DR, liver function test, and CRP were, was within the normal ranges. His hepatitis B surface antigen and anti-HCV were non-reactive. Chest X-ray PAU was normal with normal lung, lung parenchyma and no abnormal lymph adenopathy was seen. ECG and echo were normal. Passing lipid profile showed a low HDL of 21 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, total cholesterol, LDL, and serum triglyceride were, in the, were within the normal ranges. So we took a skin uh, excisional skin biopsy of the lesions of the face. That showed, epidermis showed keratinized squamous epithelium showing mild irregular hyperplasia. Upper dermis showed mild perivascular chronic inflammatory infiltrate. Large areas of ill-defined lesions composed of severe chronic infiltrate with predominant plasma cells arranged in diffuse sheets and nodules. It makes large number of foamy histiocytes arranged singly as well as in aggregates. Multifocal areas reveal aggregates of plump histiocytes showing abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm with large vesicular nuclei showing open vesicular chromatin and prominent nucleoli. Some of the larger histiocytes reveal cytoplasm showing affected lymphocytes, the phenomenon of empiripolysis. The histiocytic aggregates are surrounded by reactive lymphoid cells and plasma cells with focal formation of lymphoid follicles with reactive germine, germinal centers. The opinion nodular as well as irregular smaller skin tissue showed morphological features favoring lymphohistiocytic lesion. The morphological profile was compatible with Rosie Dorfman disease. As no immunohistochemistry markers were done, so we went for a re-review of the biopsy with the immunohistochemistry markers. The microscopic examination was similar. The immunohistochemistry marker showed CD20 and CD3 were positive in B and T cells in equal proportion. CD138 was positive in plasma cells. CD168 and S100 were positive in histiocytes. CD1A was negative. The features were in favor of Rosie Dorfman disease. Now, a few words about the disease before we proceed further. It's a rare non langerhans cell histiocytosis, which is characterized by accumulation of activated histiocytes within the affected tissues, which are S100, CD68 positive, and CD1A negative. It may present as unifocal or multifocal disease. Classical presentation is bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy. Extranodal involvement is seen in 43% of the cases, with cutaneous involvement in 10% of the extranodal cases. The isolated cutaneous disease is even rarer. The extranodal involvement can be cutaneous, intracranial, spinal, ophthalmic, head and neck, intrathoracic, retroperitoneal, genitourinary, GI, bone, or hematological. Cutaneous presentation is usually papillonodular, indurated plaque, or tumor type. Rarer presentation includes subcutaneous nodules and paniculitis type lesion. It is associated with neoplasias like lymphomas and leukemias, immune-related diseases like SLE, IgG4 association is controversial. Management is usually by observation alone. 
Now, since rosoid Dorfman disease can also present with subcutaneous nodules and paniculitis type lesion, we went for an excisional biopsy of the nodule of the forearm. It showed a benign adipocytic lesion with features consistent with lipoma. There was no lipoblast, no evidence of malignancy seen. The conclusion were features were suggest suggestive of lipoma. Now, we went for a hemato-oncological review for the assessment of the systemic involvement of the disease. And they advised us certain special investigation, CT scan chest, ultrasound abdomen and pelvis, ultrasound neck, and X-ray paranasal sin uh, sinus for any local involvement. Uh, the LDH uh, turned out to be raised, 543 units per liter. Uric acid was within the normal ranges. ANA and rheumatoid factor were negative. HIV on ICT was non-reactive. CT scan chest were grossly unremarkable and there was no evidence of mediastinal or hyalur lymphadenopathy. Ultrasound abdomis and, abdomen and pelvis and ultrasound neck were also normal. There were no abnormal uh, or enlarged lymph nodes seen. X-ray paranasal sinus was also normal. So since the patient had no systemic involvement and no obvious lymph node uh, involvement, so we made the finest di final diagnosis as cutaneous rosai Dorfman disease. Now, since uh, now uh, the management plan, we had already surgically excised the facial lesion. Now, plan is to observe the existing lesion on the forearm and for the new uh, onset of uh, lesions. With the consensus of the hemato-oncological uh, department, if there is new development of B symptoms, any enlarged lymph nodes on six monthly surveillance and uh, anemia, we will plan to take the patient uh, further. Now, a literature review. Uh, this is a case report that was published in American Journal of Surgical Pathology with the title Cutaneous Rosai Dorfman Disease, a clinical and histopathological study of 25 cases in China. It showed that the clinically 39 skin lesions in 25 patients were divided into three main types. Papular nodular was the most common type, 79.5%. Uh, and clinical follow-up in 22 patients ranging from 2 to 55 months indicated that surgical excision was the exclusive effective uh, treatment for cutaneous rosai Dorfman disease. This is another case uh, report that was published in Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery with the title Cutaneous Rosai Dorfman Disease of the Face. It showed that the most commonly affected facial uh, skin regions were the cheeks and periorbital area, and most lesions were multiple in number. The vast majority of facial cutaneous rosai Dorfman disease lesion presented at asymptomatic, non-ulcerative, red, nodular plaques with duration ranging from one month to a few years. Surgical excision was the most effective treatment method. Now, this is a case report that was published in Clinical, Cosmetic, and in uh, Investigational Dermatology with the title Self-Limited Primary Cutaneous Ro Rosai Dorfman Disease. It stated that the patient uh, was diagnosed with primary papular nodular type of cutaneous rosai Dorfman disease and no treatment regime was initiated. After three months follow-up, the skin lesions were, had partially disappeared, confirming that the, it can also have spontaneous regression. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Ira Mashra for the concluding remarks on this case. Thank you. Assalamu everyone, and thank you, Dr. Mizra, for uh, the case presentation. So I'm Dr. Eram Ashraf. I'm FCPS Dermatology, and I'm working here as consultant dermatologist and also a supervisor for the DDEM program. Now, coming to our case, as you know, the diagnosis of the disease is cutaneous rosai Dorfman disease. Now, let's have a brief overview, as Dr. Mizra has already discussed. It is a rare variant of non-Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Its cutaneous presentation is said to be rare, while the isolated cutaneous form is even more rare. So because of the rarity of the disease, we did some literature search, but unfortunately, there's paucity of data regarding the management guidelines. Um, I'm sharing these guidelines with you. These are the best available guidelines uh, for uh, Rosai Dorfman disease. And this was published by American Society of Hematology in 2018. Now, uh, whenever we come across a case of Rosai Dorfman disease, first, uh, we have to see the extent of the disease and rule out systemic associations. 
the second most important thing is to rule out other associated diseases like malignancies and autoimmune diseases. Just like in our case, we ruled out malignancies and all the uh, autoimmune diseases like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Why? Because the prognosis as well as the management depend on these important factors. Um, now, talking about the management guidelines, uh, if the disease is unifocal and asymptomatic, one reasonable approach is to go for um, simple observation, as the disease is said to be self-limiting in 20 to 50 percent cases, and the prognosis is said to be really good. Prognosis is bad only when the disease involves uh, the low respiratory tract, kidneys, or when the disease is very multifocal or widespread. Now, the second option, which is said to be the best treatment option available, is to go for surgical debulking or primary excision of all the accessible sites. And um, then the patient can be followed up in the OPD to look for relapse of the disease or recurrence of the disease. And in any such case, we have to think about starting systemic therapy. Now, unfortunately, again, there is no consensus among authors that um, which is the best first-line therapy or the best second-line therapy. And uh, the options available are basically on, based on uh, experiences of individual authors. Um, the best first-line therapy is said to be prednisolone, uh, which is started at a dose of 1 mg per kg per day for at least six months period with a slower taper off. If at any point we notice that the patient is not responding to the disease, or if the disease is getting widespread, then we have to think about starting second immunomodulator. And that could be azathioprine, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, or even CHOP therapy. Or some have started uh, an experience with uh, biologic therapies like TNF-alpha blockers, rituximab, even thalidomide. And there are many other options. Radiotherapy can be added in cases when the patient is not responding to systemic therapy alone or when there's contraindication of systemic therapy. So um, our patients, this is a picture uh, three months post excision. We went for um, surgical excision and so far he's doing good. There's no relapse of the disease. The few lesions which are left on the shoulder, these are still stable. And so far he's doing good. Uh, this was all from our side and thank you for listening. Let's move to our next case, thank you. बोर्ड वाइटल्स में बोर्ड वाइटल नहीं नहीं डर्मा फोल्डर पे जाओगे ना मालिक होगी बोर्ड वाइटल बिन का बुक नहीं है किसी ने कंपाइल करके डाला बोर्ड वाइटल और जो सर तहीर सलीम तुझे तो करने और शिफ्ट वाले बुक नींदा क्लास हो रही है ना मैं क्लास में ना नींदा आज वो लेने तो बुरुक सालों के बुरुक सालों के मुझे कौन सा कुछ करना है बस प्रेजेंट अटेंडेंस कराने के अस्सलामुअलैकुम आई एम डॉक्टर अरिशा अरशद पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट ट्रेनिंग ऑफ डिप्लोमा इन डर्मेटोलॉजी टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू शेयर अ केस विद यू ड्यूरिंग द सीबीसी अ 31 इयर ओल्ड मेल मिस्टर गुलाम कादर रेजिडेंट ऑफ बदीन फार्मर बाय ऑक्यूपेशन cigarette smoker with no known comorbids presented with multiple scattered cauliflower like skin lesions involving upper limbs lower limbs trunk and face since last 25 years according to the patient he was in his usual state of health 25 years ago when his parents noticed a pea sized rash on the dorsum of his hand it was fluid filled initially which burst to leave a crusted lesion the lesion was dry itchy and not painful which gradually extended to involve the face back hands ears and legs in a scattered distribution since last few years the lesion grew more in number and size the patient and his family does not recall any history of trauma the patient does not give any history of fever weight loss or night sweats there was no associated weakness paresthesia or joint pain in personal history Appetite, bowel habits, maturation, and sleep are normal. He is a cigarette and nasvar addict. Weight loss is also absent. In systemic review, 
is respiratory, alimentary, cardiovascular, nervous, musculoskeletal, and urinary system were normal. Uh, his past medical, surgical, and transfusion history were insignificant. In family history, both the parents are alive and healthy with no known comorbids. He has four siblings and all are alive and healthy with no known comorbids. He is married to his cousin since five years and has no any offspring. In drug history, the patient took some symptomatic treatment from the local hospital in Badin, but there is no record available. In socioeconomic history, the patient lives in Badin in a well-ventilated house. He has completed his education till 12th grade. He is farmer by occupation. His father is a policeman who earns for the whole family. Now moving on towards examination. On examination, a young male of average build and height, sitting comfortably, well oriented with time, place and person. In vital, he has BP of 120 by 80 millimeter of mercury, pulse 80 beat per minute. He is afebrile with respiratory rate of 18 breaths per minute. Subvitals, anemia, jaundice, clubbing, cyanosis, edema and dehydration are absent. JVP is not raised. Lymph nodes and thyroid are not found. Husband ke chote hoti thi lampon pe. Examination. Uske baad hai to pehle hospital ke unko aata baad hai. Mujhe kya sir aur kya madam ko dikha rahe hain. Mujhe bahut zyada chote hote hain. Madam chote to lagi hai takriban do teen hafte pehle. Uske baad is normal or condition to form varicose plaque and pupils. एक्सटेंडिंग फ्रॉम मिड ऑफ द फोर आर्म proximally to involve metacarpophalangeal joint distally there are few scattered similar lesions on the upper two third of the forearm on the extensor aspect towards the left you can see two hyperkeratotic violaceous plaques present on the left shoulder joint towards the right uh, hyperkeratotic violaceous plaques present with center clearing and a well demarcated rounded border Uh, similar varicose plaques are present on his nose, ear, trunk, and left knee joint. Here you can see varicose plaque on nose, ear, trunk, and left knee joint. His respiratory examination, abdominal examination, musculoskeletal examination, and CNS examination were unremarkable, and so was his cardiovascular examination. so what could be the differential diagnosis our possible differential diagnosis were thromoblastomycosis tuberculosis varicose acutis cutaneous leishmaniasis and atypical mycobacterial infection moving on towards investigation in complete blood count hemoglobin of 14.5 gram per deciliter with mcv of 91.3 femtoliter total leukocyte count of 8.3 with neutrophilic predominance of 64% and lymphocytes 30% his platelets were within the normal range but esr was 40 mm in first hour in biochemical analysis random glucose of 140 mg per deciliter blood urea 35 mg per deciliter and serum creatinine was 0.9 mg per deciliter his liver function tests were within the normal range urine dr was also normal His viral markers were non-reactive to hepatitis B, C, and HIV. The test X-ray is also normal. Ultrasound abdomen is also normal. So what next? In histopathology, underlying dermis shows chronic granulomatous inflammation with multinucleated giant cells. There are numerous giant pigmented fungal hyphae. No caseous necrosis is seen. No evidence of LT bodies. features of invasive fungal infection were seen concomitantly tissue sample for fungal smear and culture were also sent fungal smear was positive which revealed moderate septate pigmented hyphae in fungus culture three species were identified including candida albicans candida tropical and alternaria species out of which sensitivity of only two candidial species were checked and according to this sensitivity the patient was started on fluconazole but his lesions did not decrease in size or number even after 2 months follow up 
So, in fact, new nodular lesion appeared on the dorsum of his left hand. Hence, it was decided to review the diagnosis and send a second histopathology sample. The repeated histopathology showed the epidermis shows prominent hyperkeratosis and hyperplasia. The underlying dermis shows epithelioid granulomata with multiple scattered joint, multinucleated giant cells containing intracytoplasmic pigmented fungal hyphae with septation and occasional global swelling. These are positive on spe special PST staining as well as brocade silver staining. Adjacent mixed inflammation is also noted. So in diagnosis, skin tissue exhibiting features of pheohyphomycosis with prominent granulomatous inflammation and marked hyperplasia and hyperkeratosis of the epidermis surface. The patient was given tablet voriconazole 200 mg twice daily, topical clotramazole cream with field ointment. So a uh, picture on the left shows the lesion at the time of presentation. On the right, after three months treatment, you can see reduction in varicose appearance of the lesion and receding margins. Here you can see the dorsum of right hand improvement in the lesion with receding margin after three months. Here you can see a varicose appearance the shoulder joint at the time of presentation has reduced significantly after three months follow. Similarly, here you can appreciate improvement in the trunk lesion. So our final diagnosis was pheohyphomycosis. Moving on towards the brief discussion on pheohyphomycosis. Pheohyphomycosis is a rare generally localized subcutaneous or intramuscular infection, usually a cyst or an abscess caused by a range of brown pigmented fungi. Positive organisms are Exophiella gensilmi, Exophiella dermatitidis, Bipolaris species, and Alternaria alternata. Alternaria was also seen in the culture of our patient, but its sensitivity was not checked by the lab. The clinical features are well-defined cystic lesion on trunk or limbs. It's not usually painful. It can grow large enough to warrant removal, and usually the diagnosis is made at this stage. The differential diagnoses are Baker cyst and large pilar cyst. Investigations are culture, histopathology with PS staining, Fontana mason staining for melanin, and Gomori methamine silver stain. Usual treatment is excision and antifungal such as etraconazole is often given after debulk surgery. Here I would like to share two case reports which were similar to our case. Uh, this case report is taken from Journal of Clinical and Diagnostic Research published in September 2013. A 40-year-old male who was agriculturist by occupation who had no previous medical illness presented with recurrent growth over the left forearm and elbow region. The lesions were non-itchy and they were formed by several confluent nodular areas which had a foul smelling and a hemopurulent discharge. He had similar growths over his forehead, back and left elbow three years back which were excised and grafted in a local hospital. Here you can see uh, the clinical image of the patient. He was subjected to a wide excision and skin grafting, which were done in a single setting. Excised tissue section were stained with hematoxylin and eosin, uh, Gomori's methylamine silver stain, and periodic acid shift staining, which were admixed with yeast-like spores, uh, which were consistent with the diagnosis of pheohyphomycosis. He was put on a long-term antifungal treatment. Here you can see a darkly pigmented septate hyphal fragment, the microscopic appearance. This is another case report taken from Indian Journal of Dermatology, Venerology and Leprology, published in December 2021. A 26-year-old married woman, agriculturist by profession, presented with several skin lesions affecting her face and extremities for the last seven years, gradually increasing in size. There was no past history of known trauma. Cutaneous examination revealed multiple groups skin color to hyperpigmented varicose papules, nodules, and plaque, diameters ranging from a few millimeter to six centimeter affecting the bilateral forearm, right knee, left leg, and right cheek. They were non-tender and soft to form on palpation. No lymphadenopathy was noted. Here you, you can see these lesions are very similar to our patient's lesion. Histological examination of a representative papule demonstrated pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with nodular granulomatous infiltrate in the dermis and multiple pigmented septate hyphae. You can see a pigmented septate hyphae in the stratum corneum stained with GMS staining. And on the left, on the right, you can see conidia with protruding hilum uh, with lactophenol cotton blue stain. So the combination therapy of oral intraconazole 200 mg twice daily with oral flucytosine 500 mg four times a day 
was given, uh, resulting in significant improvement of her lesion within one month. Notably, she failed to respond to intra intravenous amphotericin B previously. Patient showed marked improvement in the lesion after treatment. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to call my supervisor, Dr. Faryal, for concluding remarks. So, um, Samnikam. Thank you, Dr. Arisha, for the wonderful presentation. I am Dr. Faryal Sharif, an FCPS dermatologist, and currently one of the supervisors of Diploma Program in Dermatology. Now, the reason for presenting this particular case is the atypicality of uh, the clinical presentation and the rarity of, its, uh, of the disease itself. It normally presents as large cystic lesions, but in our case, it presented as verrucous plaques. But there have been similar case reports in uh, the literature. Secondly, uh, the, the patient uh, usually has to be offered a combination therapy of uh, debulking surgery along with uh, antifungal therapy, but our patient refused because there were numerous scattered lesions present all over his body. Also, he opted for an outpatient treatment, so we offered him boriconazole. And he's currently improving on it, and we're closely monitoring him. Now, thirdly, what I want to discuss, and I can't overemphasize on the fact of early referrals and early diagnosis, this poor patient remained undiagnosed for 25 years out of his 31 years of lifespan. Ek mariz itni advanced scientific door mein 25 saal tak undiagnosed rahe. So it is not only a stigma for the patient, it is also a stigma for us um, that the patient did not reach to us sooner, he was not diagnosed sooner. So please, in your centers, uh, wherever you are, or who, whichever doctor that, that you know, bhale wo speciality ke bhi na ho, just stress on early referrals. It will just be beneficial for the patient. So thank you. And uh, next, I would uh, like to call Dr. Asraj and Dr. Farhan, her supervisor, for the last clinical presentation. Thank you. I'm Dr. Asra Bibi, postgraduate training of DDM at Institute of Skin Disease Hospital. So this is the fourth case. So uh, this is the fourth case presentation of the CPC. Finally, last but not the least. So let's start case study. A 30-year-old female from Oman presented to our OPD with complaint of painful rate raised ulcerated lesion on most part of the body, mainly on face, flagellar for eight months. 
According to patients, she was usually state of health, then she developed a papular pustular rash or freeze, multiple area of body, including face, groin, inframammary lesion, intermammary region, eight months back. It also associated with thick and discolored nails. This papular pustular lesion causes at flexure, including groin, intermammary areas, and form plaque, which later become ulcerated and macerated. It was associated with pain, burning, and pruritus. On face, she developed papules around nose and lips, which were a bit oozy, that caused to form plaque and nodules with scaling and eczema. The patient visited multiple doctors for this problem, but with no improvement. There was no significant past medical history. Her family history revealed that she is divorced with no children. She denies any illicit drug use and smoking. Her personal history was normal. On general physical examination, the patient is of average height, build, and widely stable, conscious, and cooperative. Anima genre sinuses, velar, edema, uh, sinuses, velar, clumping, are all negative except edema, which was positive. On cuteness examination, there is multiple erythematous crusted greasy papules and nodules configured to form small plaque. It extends from perinasal area to the mid of the nose. Similar scaling erythematous papules bilaterally on upper lip. Well demarcated erythematous plaque with ulcer of 2 into 2 cm with hyperpigmented border on interdryginous areas. Erythematous ulcerated plaque with maceration and crusting on intermammary and inframammary area. It also associated with thickened, discolored, and completely dystrophic nails with peri under soiling and pigmentation with loss of the nail plate. Her systemic examination was unremarkable, except that there were crackle and occasional diseases on auscultation, mainly on the lower half of the right lung. So what could be the differential diagnosis? On the basis of the history and clinical examination, we made these differential diagnosis. We kept pemphigus vegetans on the top, heli-heli disease, Langerhans cell astrocytosis, sarcoidosis, hydroadenitis suppurativa, Paget disease, infective subarub dermatitis with or without HIV. So we did investigation. The CBC show neutrophilia and rest of the CBC were normal. Serum electrolytes, creatinine and glucose were normal. Liver function tests were unremarkable. Urine analysis report show white blood cells, 11 high profile field, and RBC show greater than 100 high profile field. Rest of urine report were normal. Artomine profile were uh, ANA anti double stand DNA, and ENA profile were negative. So we planned for biopsy and we took bios. These biopsy were taken from the papular lesion of the lip and it was sent for histopathology and immunohistochemical marker. Histopathology shows that skin uh, show focal erosive, irregular acanthosis along with hyper and parakeratosis. The dermis has descent, has dense inflammatory infiltrate and appear to be of mixed quality in upper dermis. There are sheet of monomorphic polygonal cell with elongated groove nuclei and isnoflex cytoplasm. Immunohistochemical stain show CD1A positive, S100 positive, CD68 patchy positive, and CD4 positive. Immunofluorescence show IgG, IgA, IgM, C1Q or all negative. So on the basis of the histopathology, immunofluorescence, immunohistochemical marker, finally the diagnosis of the adult Langerhans cell histocytosis was met. So the patient was evaluated for multi-system involvement. For this purpose, we went for the chest X-ray, which came normal. We did bronchoalveolar lavage, which uh, the smear show hemocidin laden pulmonary macrophage with inflammatory cell with mucus, MCT are seen squamous and few bronchial cells.
and then then we went for the skeleton survey this, which show this reduced bone density no congenital anomaly seen no evidence of erosive or lytic lesion seen impression no abnormality detected on skeleton survey so let's summarize case summary a 30 year old female presented with eight month history of multiple ulcerated papules and clock on her scar face into trigenous areas along with discolored and dystrophic nails her lesion were persistent and refractory to treatment histopathology showed the langer has cells diffusely infiltrated in the dermis and the tumor cell were positive for cd1a ace 100 cd68 and cd4 so diagnosis of the Langerhans cell histocytosis was made on the basis of the histopathology and immunohistochemical marker. So patient was managed on multidisciplinary approach. Oncologists and pulmonologists were taken on board. We started the symptomatic treatment like antibiotic, topical steroid along with PUA therapy. Patient partially respond on this management. So the patient show improvement after four to six weeks. Then she later she left for Oman and continue treatment there. So this is the picture of before and after treatment. So let's refresh the knowledge regarding Langerhans cell histocytosis. Langerhans cell histocytosis is a proliferated disease characterized by the accumulation of excessive Accumulation of CD1A plus Langerhans cell in various sites leading to tissue damage. The classification of LCH is based on number of organ system involved with an initial subdivision, single system LCH and multi system LCH. Single system again divided into unifocal and multifocal, and multi system divided into low risk and high risk disease. Single system bone LCH is the most common form of LCH. The skull wall is the most frequent site. Single system skin SCH is the second most common form. Multi system SCH can involve any organ, gonads, and kidney are usually spared. Cutaneous manifestation appearance of skin lesion is very variable, include macules, papules, flock, basilar, pustule, bullae, crusted, ulcerated lesion, and gives seborrheic like dermatitis pattern. Unusual persistence of cradle cape and nappy rash even in the infancy should suggest the possibility of the LCH and warrant biopsy. Clinical feature skin LCH in adult 14.3% of adult with skin system single system LCH and 62% with multi system LCH have skin involvement. So our case belongs to 40.3% single system SCH. Alteration of flexure, groin, perianal, vulval area is common. The lesion may papular, pustular, nodular, erythematous, polypoid, peduncular. It may involve the nail and mucosa. Skin only SCH seen in very young child may undergo spontaneous regression within week or many months or disease may progress to multi-system SCH high-risk disease. In infant from birth to four weeks of age, skin only SCH is sometimes called Hashimoto risk disease or congenital self-healing reticular histocytosis. Multi skin SCH is a part of low-risk multi-system disease, formerly known as hence cooler Christian syndrome. It is a chronic multi multifocal form of SCH characterized by the presence of the lactic bone lesion, exophthalmus, diabetes insipidus, premature tooth eruption. Cutaneous manifestation nodules and tumor that are yellow, brown in color or with seborrheic like picture. Skin involvement as a part of disseminated disease, it most extensive and severe form of SCH, usually seen under the age of two years, manifest as the atypical seborrheic like pattern in the scalp and nape area. Extensive ulceration, super infection, patekia, and purpura may accompany skin lesion. Multiple organs involved include bone, liver, spleen, lungs, and it carries worse prognosis. So treatment option for skin only SCH is topical therapy, topical or intralesional corticosteroid, topical nitrogen mustard, and topical trichrolimus, ultraviolet light therapy, UVB and PUA, surgical excision for localized disease, radio therapy, and systemic therapy. Skin only SCH unresponsive to topical therapy 
Then we go for the first line treatment include methotrexate, azathioprine, thalidomide, interferon alpha, combination of alpha, interferon alpha and thalidomide. Second line option is citrobine, vinblastin or pinosolone and etoposide. I would like to thank Dr. Fanan and Dr. Nazia for wonderful support and I would like, uh, I would like to call for uh, Dr. Fanan to come forward and proceed. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, thank you Dr. Sarah. It was a wonderful effort I must say. I'm Dr. Farhan Mir Sheikh working as a consultant dermatologist at Institute of Skin Diseases in Karachi. Uh, I'm supervisor for the DDEM program as well. I'm uh, working along with my team as a team lead uh, for uh, specialized clinics that include psoriasis, vitiligo, dysmeniasis and phototherapy. So that's why we bring the case of phototherapy. So why is citrosis for the CPC? This is the common differential of the common diseases, despite the fact it is not very common. So that's why we thought that we should bring it uh, for our juniors and colleagues so that this should be a great learning uh, activity. So commonly, whenever we are receiving the histiocytosis case, we go for the multidisciplinary approach. So in such case, we uh, send our patient to the representation jelly. We send our case to the, for the multidisciplinary approach to the oncologist, pulmonologist, and etc. Most of the time, we don't know about the management of the histiocytosis. So I have brought uh, uh, just two minute article. Uh, the first minute would be important, but the second minute would be very important. So we will be knowing about the uh, management of the histiocytosis through this case report. You will see that in this case, the first line failed. They went for the second line. The second line again failed. Then they went for the third line. And finally, the case was treated. Page is A 32 year old man smoker, family history of thyroid disease, presented in the emergency room with a multiple painful anal lesions just few weeks prior to the presentation. But the past medical history was he was having diabetes and CPDF 10 years ago. Yani jo histocytosis ka process tha, wo 10 years ago start hua, but his skin lesions developed just few weeks ago. Six years ago, he developed the pulmonary involvement, that is, curve, excessional dyspnea, etc. Chest auscultation revealed feces at the upper lip. Transbronchial biopsy showed adult Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Microscopic examination of the anal canal revealed cutaneous lesions infiltrating of the anal sphincter. Circumferential perianal involvement. Chest x ray camilla, cystic lesions with honeycombing. Histopathology in a confirmed cardiac, it is LCH. So the important minute of my presentation, we went for the treatment. So initially the IV chemotherapy with wind blast in 10 milligram on day one and then 15 was started. MRI shows no evidence of the disease in rectosigmoid region. It means improvement after two more cycles. When we in the, and they go for the CT scan, what did it show? Again, honeycombing perianal infiltration, colonoscopy shape, colonic nodules. It means no response. He then received cytarabia. It was added to the initial therapy that included vinblastin and prednisolone. No evidence of rectal tumor recurrence. Very good. More than 60% decrease in the size of the colonic nodules. It was also good. But patient got hospitalized for rectoragia. It means it was not well tolerated. But CT scan didn't show any disease progression. CT scan ne achi khabar sunai. When we when they go for the histopathology examination of the colonic biopsy, showed persistent histiocytosis. It means again second line failed to respond completely. So they went for the uh, after three weeks he received gemcitabine and cisplastin. So it was the third line. 
So it was a regime that was well tolerated. Colonoscopy shows normal mucosa. Repeat CT scan show no anal lesions. Lung finding were stable. And he was being followed up at outpatient clinic every two weeks for next six months. And there was persistent response. So he was clinically stable with no major complaint. So the message is loud and clear, not only for this case, but every case and in your life as well, that failures are not final. Rather, these are the initial steps for success. Thank you, everyone. I would like to start formally the question answer session, and I will call Dr. Rizwan for further proceeding. Um, thank you everyone for your patient listening. Um, we are here now for the post and answer session, but when we are looking at the chat box, we have some comments on the rest of the question. So, when the question is not, it means that the session is good or not good. So, just to answer Ma'am Najia's question, um, uh, comments. Um, actually, uh, हमारा ये जो केस रिपोर्ट है जिसमें हमने एक टेंपोरल रिलेशनशिप देखा ऑफ मेटानोडाजोल विद दिस बबून सिंड्रोम यस ऑफ कोर्स वी शुड लेबल द केस दिस इन बबून सिंड्रोम इज सेकंड ही मेटानोडाजोल बट इसके लिए हमें थोड़ी एविडेंस पहले चाहिए जिसके लिए हमने पेशेंट को पेस्ट टेस्ट एडवाइस किए अगर वो कंफर्म करती है तो हम पेशेंट को लेबल कर सकते हैं और हमने पेशेंट का ऑफ कोर्स काउंसिल किया रिगार्डिंग द दिस कल्प्रेट दो बातें मैं और करना चाहूँगा यहाँ पे। First of all कि मतलब we are very thankful for the paid to give us this opportunity to present our cases in in the platform। और एक चीज जो एक additional चीज मैं कहूँगा कि जब हम ये चार presenter जो एक चार तीन different institute को represent कर रहे हैं, जैसे मैं मेरा ताल्लुक basically आखान से or Dr. Farhan from PNS Shifa and Dr. Faryal and Dr. Iram is from Seville Hospital. So basically, if we are doing something good or trying to do something good, this is a reflection of our teachers and mentors. So in the end, we are very thankful for our teachers that they have given us such a good guide and we are thankful for our teachers that they have given us such a good guide and they are giving us such a good guide. So and this is the administration of the IST, the Institute of Skin Disease of Skin Disease, जहाँ पे जब मैं ट्रेनिंग में यहाँ केसेस देखने आते थे हम सब लोग तो बड़ी हमारी ख्वाहिश होती थी कि हमें यहाँ चांस मिले काम करने का हम यहाँ फ्लोरिश यहाँ यहाँ हमारी ग्रोथ हो क्योंकि एक बंडल ऑफ वो जो केसेस हैं एक लिस्ट ऑफ कंडीशन है जो हम एग्जाम केसेस में भी देख रहे थे और फिर हमें यहाँ पे भी नजर आ रही है तो एक बड़ी अपॉर्चुनिटी अल्लाह पाक ने हमें दी है तो जब हम यहाँ पे ये चीजें देख रहे हैं कर रहे हैं तो somehow हमारी एक effort होती है कि जो चीजें यहाँ से हम देख रहे हैं हम society में भी उसको करें तो इदारे में रहते हुए हमने थोड़ी कोशिश की है कि हम कुछ filtration cleaning करें chronic dermatosis को address करें एक अच्छा inpatient unit यहाँ पे चल रहा है for research side of course हमारी director बड़ी interested है कि हम थोड़ा इन चीजों को और encourage करें so that's it from our side and again we are very thankful to you for your patient learning and for the paid for uh, arranging this wonderful platform for us. And that's it from our side. Thank you very much.